This episode of the Kill by Kill podcast is brought to you by Orphan First Kill. It's now in theaters and on digital and on demand. Uh, Orphan First Kill stars Isabel Furman as she returns as Esther in this terrifying prequel to the original and shocking horror hit, which also stars the one and only Julia Stiles. You can buy or rent Orphan First Kill or see it in theaters today. It's rated R and from Paramount Pictures. Now, you can bring home Orphan First Kill right now. All you have to do is email us at killbykillpod at gmail.com with Orphan in the subject line, and you just might receive one of five digital codes that you can use to watch this truly fun little horror flick for yourself. That's killbykillpod at gmail.com with Orphan in the subject line for your own digital copy of Orphan First Kill. And now, the body count continues. dedicated to celebrating the least discussed component of any horror film, the characters. We're going to unpack all the goriest of details of how the house on Sorority Row, the 1982 version, in the hopes that a sorority girl's untimely end is just the beginning of the jokes we might make at their expense. And as always, there's only one person that I trust that if I push a corpse-filled dumpster into a cop car, she'll let me make a run for it. The one, the only, Gina Radcliffe. How are you doing today, Gina? I'm good. I've got my uh, my sword cane sharpened and, and ready to go. <laughs> Just ready to yeah, swing uh, it and we'll miss notice. <laughs> it, it's quite a, a sharp cane for something that doesn't have a super sharp end, but uh, the killer does manage to get it through a lot of people's bodies. It, it's got a sharp tip and a sharp <laughs> handle. I guess it seems kind of blunt, if I'm being honest with you. Most wooden poles don't slide so quickly through people's spines and rib cages, but I, I guess our killer just has a, a, a way with canes. She's, she's got that Mrs. Voorhees, uh, well, they've got that Mrs. Voorhees crazy arm strength. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of pronoun usage going on. Yeah. <laughs> but Gina, uh, before we go too far, I, I don't want to scare you because we are not alone. That is right. We have a special guest. Now, you may know her uh, as as an actress. Uh, she appeared on Days of Our Lives, something near and dear to my heart. And, of course, uh, films like, oh, I don't know, Friday the 13th, Part 7, The New Blood. In addition to that, she's also a screenwriter, a novelist, and in her new book, All the Girls in Town, is now available anywhere you get books. The one, the only, Stacy Grayson. How are you doing today, Stacy? Hey, guys. How's it going? So happy to have you. I want to call it a cane with a purpose. <laughs> a purpose, but the cane. purpose <laughs> wasn't for uh, the purpose wasn't for uh, using a cane. <laughs> yeah, our house mother does not seem to need to lean on it. No, Mrs. Slater does not need that cane. Or she just wants to appear like a, a, a fine Southern gentleman. I'm not entirely sure <laughs> what the purpose of the cane is going into it. Before we begin down the road to the house on Sorority Row, though, we would just we would simply be remiss. Like our audience would reach through the Internet and start throttling us. If we didn't ask you at least one or two questions in regards to your role in Friday the 13th, part seven. Now, in this, in this, and I, I, I put this in quotes, in this motion picture, um, you, you play a girlfriend and your boyfriend's birthday is at a, at a cabin. Yes. Uh, and uh, I think I forgot to put oil in the car. 
you know, yeah, I often blame Becky for not putting oil in the car yeah. when we go places because that is the girlfriend's job. In remote put dirt. oil in the car. Oh, no, wait, that was my line. When's the last time you put, that was my line. When's the last time you put oil in this thing? And I, it was my first big movie. So I did a horror movie before Friday the 13th, part seven. Mm -hmm. It's the worst horror movie ever made. If you can get your hands on it, it's fantastic. It was called Terror Night, but now I think it's called Bloody Movie. Okay. Um, and I was the only one who lived through the whole movie and I ran around in the woods in a pink jumpsuit. And in that movie... <laughs> I, uh, while we were shooting it, I became really good friends with another young actor who also didn't die until the end, William Butler. And mm. William Butler plays my boyfriend in Friday the 13th, part seven. I see. So that's how I got the job was from Billy Butler. Billy Butler in this movie is the birthday boy the birthday that everyone boy. has come together to celebrate. How do these people who all hate one another know your boyfriend? Because they're, none of these people appear, the common <laughs> mistake that people make is like, it's teens in the woods. These people are not teens. Because you would know one another if you were teens and you all went to the same high school. How do these people know your boyfriend in this movie? Well, uh, they all knew, uh, the, they know him from the director. <laughs> <laughs> they know him from John Beekler because John Beekler was a really good friend with everybody. So he cast a lot of his friends. That's how they know him. But, but within uh, the framework of the film, why have these people gathered to celebrate his birthday? Because Kathy asked them to come. <sighs> how does Kathy That's know that? That's my actor. Uh, That's uh, your character. Yeah. That's your motivation. Yeah. <laughs> is that her character name? That is my actor motivation, right? Thank you for the word. <laughs> Thank you for the, the word, Gina. It's been a while them. since I was an actor, and I'm like, what's that word we use? The, that, the sense of purpose. Yes, that was my motivation. <laughs> okay. So, Gina, I don't think we were far off in that this is a, a let's worry about it later excuse in Friday the 13th, part seven. <laughs> Let's get everybody yeah. in the house and just start murdering. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that no one seems to un ever look for uh, the, the main girl's uh, dad that she killed when she was a child. Well, once, right. once someone goes under the water in Crystal Lake, it's someone else's jurisdiction. It's, it's somebody the, the else's cops problem. have no place. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's wildlife and game or something. Someone else is in charge. Listen, we could talk about the new blood all day long. And those who want to know more about it, we have five, six, 28 episodes on it. Let's get back to the house on Sorority Row. Gina, when was the first time you watched this motion picture? Yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you have a lot in common with Stacy yeah. because I invited her over to my house to watch this outside. And r remind me if I'm wrong, Stacy, this was the first time you ever caught sight of this. The first time I ever caught sight, though I have heard yeah. it. <laughs> the first time you had caught wind visually yes. that the house of, on Sorority Row exists. Is actually a house all by itself on a hill. Yeah. As far as sorority rows right. go it seems to be very alone also uh sound doesn't travel inside of it that's, <laughs> that's another component but let's get into it we we start uh where all good things start on june 19th 1961 when the world was kind of black and white wait more like blue and white there's a very hazy background flashback here and we are immediately uh, braced by a pregnant woman who is obviously having a difficult time. She's, she's entered, you know, a, a stage where she has to give birth to that baby. And then a, she makes a phone call. A doctor and a nurse show up. The nurse comes into the room and basically chastises this pregnant woman for not watching closely enough how she's giving birth to a baby. <laughs> Well, you know, it's the good old days where you know, women could just give, you know, give birth out in the field and go right back to work afterwards. <laughs> right. And Dr. Beck shows up. Keep in mind that name. He will reappear later. Dr. Beck's the kind of physician who shows up to help a woman give birth to a child with a scalpel that he hasn't sanitized. <laughs> so he does what we all do. He cleans it over an open flame. Of course. <laughs> So he uses a hot scalpel to dig into this woman's womb and 
what we can only assume is that she does not deliver this baby successfully. Um, it's kind of wishy-washy, and there's a reason for that, because we need this film to kind of be Friday the 13th, but not, but also kind of be Black Christmas, but not. It's a lot of movies you've heard of, but not. And kind of Rosemary's Baby. I thought something was going to pop out of her uterus. <laughs> or I guess her belly. Sure. Well, you know. I thought for sure that like a little a little fist was going to like fly out or something <laughs> evil. That would have thrown this over the top. The way she was moaning was very concerning. Oh, yes. And the fact that all of her moaning and dialogue is delivered via ADR Correct. because <laughs> none of her none of her lines were good enough to reach the final film. I don't know if it's her delivering this dialogue or someone else was brought in, but it's entirely disconnected to any scene in which she's existing. I wonder if they didn't have a mic pack for her. Like maybe they had a budget and they <laughs> ran out of budget on sound. And so it doesn't matter if she's in, in a scene with like two people or five people. She's always the <laughs> right, we'll just do. Out. We'll just, we'll get in an ADR moving along. <laughs> Sure. Gina. We don't we don't bring this up enough on uh, on on this when we have movies that involve a mysterious doctor. Uh what is he a doctor of right. exactly? Because he helps her give birth <laughs> and then and then he's still like her doctor, like like 30 years right. later. Well tw- 20 years later. I don't know. He's a physician of the plot, I guess. <laughs> um he seems to have a very large building all to he himself. Does. And at one point. He makes a determination that someone is slowly going insane by looking at an X-ray of their brain, and then gives her, and then gives her like a, a medic alert tag, which <laughs> I don't think like you get a medic alert tag for like diabetes if you're on blood thinners. I, sure. I don't think they give them out if you have mental problems. Right. If if you're slowly going mad, please call. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Five 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 wackadoo. Um, it was very odd. Yes. Yeah. Um, so we cut to our title sequence, and I guess we're in 1982 now. Um, and we meet uh, between seven and 58 young women who get who are getting their photo taken by a guy with an extremely noticeable bald spot, and this is done without dialogue. It's just him giving them instructions and a slowly going down what appears to be the usual suspects of, of, of sorority gals who are about to graduate cut to lipstick application, packing montage, bad nail polish application, shoes fall out of closet gag, armpit shaving, hair dyeing, covering a couch with single bed sheets. It's all action and it's all in the movie. Why? We don't know. <laughs> Do you think that was added in later? I I when they were movie short. Apparently was contractually obligated to at least be 90 minutes cuz otherwise you would not need this. It's like you will believe something happens inside this house and they're like, "I don't know what could happen inside this house." You cover a couch with bed sheets? Sure. It's in the movie, everybody. Let's go. Moving on. Um, so we meet Kate. Uh, Kate is packing up her things with her mom's quote unquote help. Um, but she states she does not want to move home. And mom totally attempts to gaslight her about knowing what you want to do after four years of college. Oh, sorry, mom. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't figure out with mom who was very uh, uh uptight but pleasant. Yeah. Uh why why she let her stay? Oh okay, I guess you girls can all stay in a house that we're no longer paying for even <laughs> though the semester is up. Yeah, yeah. They, they, it, they did kind of dance right around that whole, you know, oh I'm going to stay after all. Like, we don't even get like her telling the mom that. She's like, "Oh, all right, I guess I'm going to stay and have this big elaborate party." Right. And we don't know why Kate is so in a tizzy, but uh, I'm we're going to call this the stages of Banana Town. Kate is starting here at Banana Town stage one, where she's obviously troubled about something. But at this very moment, to our knowledge, she has not committed a crime and is trying to cover it up. <laughs> and already she's a nervous wreck. It's so true. 
Yeah, yeah. It's like she's, she's very like she, she, uh, she's it, very upset about something. Yeah, it's like she cheated on her final exams and is you know you know still waiting for someone to find it out before she leaves. Right. Oh, that's a good point. It's like she didn't really graduate and she doesn't know how to tell her mom. Yeah. Yeah, it's like she she's lying about something or she just doesn't want to go home for reasons that she is not brave enough to state out loud to her mom. I, I don't know what the deal is, but she is definitely nervous. So she's starting at Banana Town level one. Uh, enter Vicky, played by Eileen Davidson, uh, who's the second days of our lives uh <laughs> veteran on this podcast the first one our guest um well it's at least fame to me so vicky has a plan and that plan is to stay in this house and have a party will kate help reluctantly or no we're not sure cut to a large black car with white wall tires driven by a woman with a cane and extremely tiny feet. This is <laughs> Mrs. Slater. She does have tiny and feet, doesn't she? She does have <laughs> minuscule feet. She's got little Yosemite Sam feet. And she's returning <laughs> from seeing the medical foundation doctor with her medical alert tag, right? Right, exactly. She's got the kind of feet that, remember the, the woman you couldn't see the face of in Tom and Jerry cartoons? <laughs> she's got that kind of tiny feet. And what I don't really understand is she really honestly doesn't need the cane. Right. Yeah. You know, she's getting, had to she's have the around, cane. She, she's getting around just fine. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. She doesn't lean on it at no point. There's does no she limp. feel like she's going to teeter. It's like she's always has that cane and she's going to use it to swing at you. Like she's going, <laughs> she's going to go full Karen on somebody when you don't give her the right change at the restaurant later on. And she's great at weirding people out. Just before she enters this nondescript mental facility, she takes one gander at a three-year-old awkwardly dribbling, dribbling a ball outside the office. And retroactively, you just want to call the police. Like, woman with cane looking at three-year-old weird. Please come and help. Well, the thing is, the reason when you get later that the, the reason why she's doing that is supposed to be kind of tragic. But, you know, but she plays it as, you know, I'm, thinking about eating that child <laughs> yeah i'm just mad she's just mad she's yeah mad. that's the thing about her like no one in this entire movie at any point is happy to talk to mrs slater like she is a bitch on tiny tiny heels and she will not let dr beck stop her from quote living as she pleases which includes spending the summer in the house where as far as we know, she lost her baby in it and is just kicking a sorority out there who lives in that house for the rest of the school year. She's like, time for you to hit the bricks. This is my house, baby. She's going to home alone it from that moment on. So she comes back with her cane and her medical alert tag only to discover that the girls are still there. Yes. If, if anyone really makes her angry, it's Vicky. Oh, she yeah. really hates Vicky. She really hates Such Vicky. A and I think we get... Uh, a an insight into why uh everyone hates vicky um we we cut from this to an abandoned barn one of our favorite places to go on kill by kill we love a barn of doom and vicky and her perpetually wet boy toy rick are using this barn for handgun shooting practice and if we have a Chekhov's <laughs> gun that's an actual gun I'm kind of impressed with this movie because usually it's everything but Gina. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah, it, it, it does come in handy. Yeah. Although it's, it's a strange um, gun that has both a blank and a live round in it at the same yeah. time. <laughs> yes. It's like it's got a switch that goes from uh, bullets don't mean anything to bullets might hit you, but also make invisible wounds it's very strange I, I it's a magic gun i guess and vicky loves shooting the gun in the barn oh yes the She's only thing that ruins gun. this the only thing that ruins this joy that she has in firing the gun is that her boyfriend rick decides to wrap himself around <laughs> her as she's shooting like just don't jump somebody while they're mid shot of a, like, I don't know a lot about guns, but don't wrap yourself around somebody while they're firing a pistol. That's a, a quick tip from us. 
Yeah, that's just gun safety 101. Cut to uh, all of our girls popping bottles because they've graduated. Sure. Uh, the timeline here is a little hard to follow. Uh, we first meet Diane, uh, who uh, is toasting to the fact that she's going to law school, which will be odd because she has a very weird grasp on the law <laughs> from every moment <laughs> post this. <laughs> so true. I didn't even think about that. Oh my gosh, Diane. She she doesn't know what's legal. She doesn't know how police work. Later, she will be frightened by the uh, appearance of a phone in a van, but we'll get to that. Uh, Then we get to Jeannie's toast. Uh, Jeannie is, quote unquote, reaching her full capacity, to which someone says that her capacity is about a quart and a half. And I'm not sure if that's a drinking joke or about something else. (laughs) I'm pretty sure it's a drinking joke. <laughs> pretty sure it's a drinking joke. <laughs> it could be. Let's say it's a drinking joke for now. Uh, let's go to our next character, Stevie. She's a brunette. And uh, she she has a toast to, during her toast, she reveals that she's gone to college to be a stewardess, um, which mm-hmm. I don't, I'm not sure is a prerequisite for Pam, Pan Am. Uh, but when they learn what she did during graduation, I'm sure that that meeting in HR is going to go great. Uh, Someone makes a cocaine joke because it's 1982. And then we meet Katie. Uh, Then Katie thanks them all for making her what she is today, wasted. And then we meet our MVP. All right. The name you need to remember about House on Sorority Hill. I'm sorry, Sorority Row. (laughs) Whatever the hell it's called. Morgan, who may have a problem with oxygen reaching her brain. (laughs) Morgan yeah, I, wanna, got, yeah. I wanna know what Morgan I wanna know what Morgan majored in in college. <laughs> not having roots. I, I'm not entirely sure what Morgan <laughs> graduated in. I'm not entirely sure how Morgan is able to make it up and down the stairs <laughs> of this house. Mor- Morgan Morgan is entranced by a jack in the box. <laughs> Uh, Morgan, we learn much later in this motion picture, has an eight by 10 of her parents on the wall of her bedroom at college. I don't even know where to go with this. Morgan (laughs) has a line rating coming up that lives in infamy. I, of all the movies we have covered in over six years, I have never heard a line reading quite like it. And I don't know that I ever will, but it's beautiful. Into the middle of the scene, however, interrupts Mrs. Slater. And like everyone else, they're so happy to see her. Whoever is dubbing her voice uh, decides to put the kibosh on any talk of current parties or future parties. Um, Then we learn that she is referred to as the house mother. And we see a bunch of photographs in which she looks exactly the same (laughs) age. And there's an entire new set of 30 women surrounding her. (laughs) Somewhere there's a painting in a closet. <laughs> yeah. I was say, or, they, or they reveal she's a vampire or something. Yes. But not a fun vampire because she eternally looks 65. And she doesn't seduce anyone. She just swings canes at your waterbed. But we'll get to that. And she um, really seems to hate her job. Oh, she, she hates really her hates job. She girls. Hates this whole setup. She hates girls. Yeah, and, and she and threatens. I, I, she yeah. makes, you know, you have to leave. You can't stay. You can't have the party. And then she leaves the room and. Let's them do everything. It's very confusing. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't she never know. Calls I don't the know campus the, police. I don't know who the what the arrangement in here is. Was she like forced to make these girls live in this house? I do not understand what the business arrangement is. Whether is she made a deal with the devil that this has to be a sorority house for nine months of the year. It's the only passive income she could possibly make. I don't know. She's a landlord. How do landlords work? I don't know. I'm certainly never going to find out. Um, we do get to sleep, see her uh, a little bit later on, very awkwardly laying down on her bed with one hand perched up like she's smoking a J. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then she murders one of these class photographs with her unreasonably sharp cane. And that's to set up the idea that she's going to murder a bunch of, of ladies later on in this motion picture. But spoiler alert, that might not be the killer. Uh, but good news, everyone. Vicky's home, and she's brought along her perpetually wet boyfriend, Rick. And they're about to have sex in their car. And she goes, wait, 
we're going to have sex somewhere else. And he's like, I don't know. I, I It only works for me in this car. We always have it in the car. <laughs> yeah. if, if tires aren't on the ground, I'm not sure my penis can work. We always do it in the car. <laughs> we always do it in, in the car. In this little tiny coop. During this whole thing where Vicky takes her boyfriend up to her waterbed, because as we learned Gina from Pieces, the the best thing in life is to get high and have sex on a waterbed. Of course. Um, Mrs. Slater ascends to the attic of doom where it becomes this becomes very obvious that this movie is kind of a stealth remake of black Christmas, making it the second black Christmas we've covered on the show and probably not the last. Uh, and we get a close up of a Jack in the box with a court jester figurine inside. It's horrifying. Which will be, it's horrifying. <laughs> Just, it is scary. The head goes in a circle or the whole body. It, the is mouth is scary. misshapen. It's it's horrifying on sight. It's not haunted, but it's kind of haunted. Definitely haunted. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Vicky unbuttons her shirt in a manner that presupposes that she and Rick have never seen one another naked, which I find very difficult to believe. And their sex scene feels like Neither of them has agreed to any of this. There's a lot of inappropriate laughing, and it's kind of like their uh, Greco-Roman wrestling, where it's a lot of upper body work. Yeah, and at one point her panties are off, and then at another point they're back on. Yeah, no, a lot of crazy magic happens here. Yeah, Uh, Mrs. Slater, of course, is the only person in the house who can hear anyone else in any other room. She goes downstairs from the attic to Vicky's room, and it appears that she's going to kill both of them in mid-coitus, but it turns out she just slashes Vicky's waterbed and orders uh, her boyfriend to leave. Now, here's a question. Yes. Uh, isn't that her house that she just basically <laughs> yes. flooded? Yeah. She she caused $4,000 worth of water damage to call Vicky a slut. <laughs> And then no one cleaned it up and it just magically disappeared. The water evaporated. That's what happens to water on the second floor of a house that filled up an entire mattress. It just evaporates into pure uh, mist and steam and goes somewhere else. Meanwhile, I think the most disturbing component here is we learned that Vicky was going to have sex with her socks on, which is... I don't know. It's not mm, good? I don't know. Well, she was also going to have it with her underwear on. <laughs> right. She was, well, also well, you, she was also going to have it with that guy. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> and let me ask you this. At this sure. point, don't you sort of want Mrs. Slater to stab her? Yes. Just a bit. I mean, he, this is um, a thing that uh, is a, a sort of evolution over time. And... You have some personal experience with this, not to bring back up uh, Friday the 13th part seven again, but there's an evolution here where at certain points they were just people hunted by a serial killer. And then at, at a certain point, they're like, one of these people has to be the worst person you ever met. And so Vicky's one of the first mean girls really shoved into the middle of a slasher movie that I can think of. I'm not sure we've, really encountered one specifically in a Friday the 13th up until the new blood. And there's not one in terror train. I I can't, there's not a mean girl in, in uh, St. Valentine, uh, the, my bloody, my bloody Valentine, my bloody Valentine. Jesus Christ, Gina, I I need to sit down. Wait a second. I'm already (laughs) sitting down. Ooh, uh, I had a brain freeze. So yeah, like Vicky is a kill on sight. And everyone else is reasonably fun to be around, but Vicky definitely has some sort of death grip on what this group of sorority sisters do. And to to state that, and to further proof, uh, we cut to poolside, and the girls all talk about how they're sick of Mrs. Slater ruining their fun. And Vicky says, why don't we just play a prank on her? And everyone is into it but Katie. And... You know, they state, for the record, we've run this place for four years. Now, what I want to know is, uh, where were these girls on January 6th? (laughs) But Kate is outvoted here. Everyone else is into pranking Mrs. Slater. Um, And then we cut to Dr. Beck, who is a great physician because he can make, he can determine if someone is insane via x-rays. At the breaking point. 
We don't know. There's a tipping point, right? Mrs. Slater is is right on the edge of the tipping point, or so we think. Right. (laughs) Which you can determine via x-rays. I just, uh, I'm not a medical doctor, but I I find that hard to believe. Cut to Mrs. Slater in her bed, and apparently she sleeps like a mummy inside a grandmother's (laughs) doily. Yes. She has a big white doily over her on that bed. Yeah, her bed is covered by the rear seat of a Japanese cab. I've never seen anything like it. And there's a big gold spittoon. I know it's her cane holder, but it looks like a spittoon. <laughs> is it a spittoon or is it something that you you pee into in the middle ah, of the night? Her like, Victorian like you're pee bowl. On Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> yes. I was going to say this, the, spittoon, the spittoon just really kind of enhances the like Yosemite Sam feel with her tiny feet. <laughs> Yeah, her, she's very old timey. Uh, she is is so mad when she discovers that the girls are continuing on with their party plan, uh, and then uh, she goes, "Where's my cane?" And Vicky goes, "Look out by the pool." And they've put the cane on a floating tire in the middle of the grossest pool you've ever seen in your life. It's dirtier than Crystal Lake. Yeah, it's fluorescent green. Lots of goop. Yes. This, this, uh, yeah, it's it's basically like like uh, like the slime from Ghostbusters. But uh, <laughs> yeah, this is like one of those like okay, somebody at some point should have said, "Yo, no, we should not do this. Can't we just put a whoopee cushion on her chair or something?" Right. It's like, exactly. You know, I mean, I, I you know, I, I really I enjoyed this movie because it really takes me back to to you know. The days of my youth when I would play a prank by on someone by pointing a loaded gun at them. <laughs> you know, the common prank when you threaten someone with shooting them dead in the face if they don't get in the pool. If they don't get in the pool to get their cane. This is what makes <laughs> Vicky the psychopath of the movie. Yes. I'm thinking she is, Vicky is bad. She is not a, a, a chill lady at all. Um, in fact, at one point, Vicky, while pointing the gun at, at this middle-aged woman, she says, you like getting people wet, right? Is this an early WAP reference? <laughs> we do learn that, um, the, that when Vicky shoots Liz in the leg during this prank, it's fake. But she's very quick with the, she's all right in the middle of it. Like, she took up, a, 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 from what we can understand, a gunshot to the leg. And she's like, don't worry about she's, her. Let's continue she's this all prank. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then it's even crazier that that Vicky, like, that that was part of the prank. Oh, I know. Yes. And then I'll shoot you and you'll pretend right. like you were hit. And that's even funnier. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm laughing myself into a migraine here. It's, it's, isn't it strange how, like, I, I wonder, can you think off the top of your head, Patrick, the last time there's been a slasher movie in which, because it was definitely a thing for a while, where oh, yeah. someone fakes their death. Yes. As a, as a, as, as a joke. Right. And people are only momentarily angry at that. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 I, and I sort of feel like that, you know, number one, that's very rarely happened in real life. And number two, you are very likely to have someone punch you dead in the face for doing something like that. <laughs> but yet, it, yeah. it just, yeah. particularly in 80s slashers, it came up over and over and over again. It is absolutely wild that no one has ever been decked for this kind of prank. And yet it happens over and over, especially in the who done it, the pranks gone wrong slashers of 1981 to 1983. But somehow this gun has bullets that either can shoot out a light or miss your friend in the leg or shoot Mrs. Slater three times, but not but then another gunshot goes off and Mrs. Slater falls in the pool and they're like, she's been shot, but there are no bullet holes. Like I'm going to need a JFK style slow motion frame by frame breakdown of how in the living hell Mrs. Slater was shot three times without any bullet holes in her. Or blood. There's no blood. Yes. There's no blood in the like, pool. There's no blood. Like, so are are they blanks and she just has like a heart attack like she's she's obviously stressed she's on the edge yeah maybe that is what i guess that's what you're supposed to assume because i mean i guess the whole she's losing her mind thing means that she has you know what used to be you know, termed as a nervous condition 
Right, <laughs> and, yes. um, and so I, 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 yeah, I mean, it's possible that she just kind of like, you know, you know, was just startled and had a yes. heart attack. Like, like that horse in Animal House. It just has a heart attack in the middle of the Dean's office. Yeah, which would be um, kind of an ironic twist because then they wouldn't have had to drag her body around and none of this would have happened because, you know, yes. they could have said, oh, gee, we don't know. She, she just had a heart attack, fell into the pool. Right. Yeah. Like, like how are they, how is like, no one's going to listen to her if she's like, well, they threatened me with a gun. What gun? Like they, like you could, you could get out of this. Like they are six young white women in 1982 they can get away with this, but no, we wouldn't have a movie if that were to happen. Yeah, Vicky's daddy's got money. He bought her the waterbed. That's true. And, you know, so what I don't get is they fish her out of the water. They're so uh-huh. worried. They fish her out of the water. And yes. then um, nobody knows CPR or really tries much of anything, but Katie thinks she's still alive. And, and, yes. And then they're like, oh, never mind. They go. They alternate between she's got to still be alive to she's totally dead because if she wasn't dead, she would have called the cops. She on us. Right? She would have called but, to a phone. <laughs> right, but they're still looking for her as if she's alive, but also looking for her as if she's dead and her corpse just got up and walked around. We'll get to that, but in the middle of this very panic scene, oh my god, the band is here. But it's okay, everyone. It's the band Four Out of Five Doctors, a band that existed. Uh, Gina, have you ever seen a band like this in your entire life? I cannot say I have. I We will get to some of the songs that they play, of which <laughs> air quotes. I have yeah, air, air quotes. quotes. It, it, honestly, um, they're not the most observant band. They don't care about the audience. Everyone who's dancing to them looks like they're dancing to a different song. But in the when they arrive with their van, they go, Vicky goes, Morgan, go head them off at the pass. And Morgan can't even run to a front door convincingly. <laughs> Poor Morgan. Oh, Morgan's uh, not enough air Mor- in the Morgan's break the now. MVP of this movie without Morgan. I don't know. I'd like it as much. She's great. You can't, you can't cast better than Morgan. She's entirely believable in this motion picture. Meanwhile, Stevie, the future stewardess is not sure if dead bodies can float. <laughs> Liz tucks the gun into her underwear, yeah. which is just great improv. Yeah. And then you, it's hard for me to believe that these six young ladies, can organize an entire bo- uh, an entire party with a live band, but they can't tie up a corpse. You know, come on. Yeah, they uh, their their organization skills seem to be it only uh, go as far as this huge party that seems to be attended by female college students and forty five year old men. <laughs> <laughs> it is a That's wild so crowd a- it, uh, that that is at this party. Um, so what I, I don't were- understand is their options sure. at the pool are. Okay, where yeah. their options are, I think she's still alive. Let's call an ambulance or mm-hmm. we should wrap her up and put her at the bottom of the pool. Yes. So they because choose they, option they, two <laughs> because the law which is student. the best option. Right? And there's a law student there. Sure. And she has zero to say right. about whether or not they could be caught for doing this. But as soon as Vicky says, if you call the police, we'll be in trouble. Everyone else like, well. I don't want to be in trouble. Right. Uh, you're already in trouble. The The trouble has happened to everyone, but it's too late. The party's happening and they all panic. And you're like, we just have to go through with this party. Yeah, I'd rather be a Loose- murderer than get in trouble. Right. <laughs> Loosely wrap this corpse in some blankets and hopefully it will sink to the bottom of this pool, which it immediately, it floats to the top. <laughs> If I described every single extra during this party sequence, Gina, we'd be here until season six of the show. We're only in season four. I mean, you know, my, my favorite character, of course, is Sea Pig. <laughs> oh, that sea poor pig. Sea Pig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Sea Pig's great. Um, uh, we have, uh, as Gina said, a, a lot of middle-aged men who are in post postgraduate school i don't know how many posts you can add to graduate school but they may be teaching there and relatively uh, young women in their 20s 
meanwhile, four out of five doctors are singing songs that appear to have been translated from Turkish into Latin and then back into English in a way that makes Rick Ocasek from the cars sound like he's just drunk. <laughs> you cannot understand a word the band sings, not a word. It, it, I think I think Space Cadet comes oh, Space up at Cadet. one point in some song, but uh, it it's it just even with the captions on, I couldn't quite like they don't even fucking bother. At, although it should be noted, at one point there are there are three sor- future sorority girls, and they're like hanging around the party, and they that you can see them check out a guy across the room, and one of them says. Hey, hey, look at him. And the camera pans over to what appears to be a fetus with an undergrown mustache <laughs> winking at them. Yeah, this and is those a, girls were so excited to get that job. If you if you if you're looking <laughs> for if you're looking for male eye candy, uh look look elsewhere because there's none to be found in this movie. <laughs> yeah. It's like they hired three actors and they just changed mustaches. Like they had interchangeable <laughs> with, you know, mustaches. Uh, meanwhile, we cut to the reanimated corpse, we believe, of Mrs. Slater and her cane as Return of the Mac fires up in the background. And then a random drunk appears who is pointing out to no one in particular, quote, this is my favorite tree in the whole world. <laughs> Who is he talking to? We we never find out. Alternatively, he then starts either looking at the camera or at the cameraman as if, should I be looking straight down the pipe of this camera? And then he's stabbed in the throat by Mrs. Slater's cane. This sequence um, does not have the best special effects in the entire world. The last time, we saw a real melted wax head quite like this. Weirdly enough, will be the third time I mention the film, Friday the 13th, part seven, The New Blood. Please tell me, please tell me someone got to take that head home with them. Yeah. Did, did everyone like have a party around the head, but it was too close to the fire and that's why it melted? I got to, I had to leave right after I got killed. No. So oh, I, sh- I showed up, I went, you know, I stood by the car and uh-huh. then we started trudging through the woods and then I got a tent stake through the neck and my part was over. Yeah. Um, why was it so cold in Crystal Lake in the middle of the summer? In Mobile, that- Alabama. Here's the weird thing about Friday the 13th we could never quite figure out. It's always supposed to be the summer and everyone is freezing in the middle of the night. It's cold at camp. Yeah, Um, but let's get back to House on Sorority Row. Let's meet Peter. He is Kate's blind date for the night. He's all man. If 97% of a man is made of a sweater vest. (laughs) Kate is uh, not taking her part in this manslaughter plot too well. I would say Kate is up to banana town level two here. I mean, I get it. I I would be, I would be like Kate. Kate is the most realistic person here. Everyone else is just staring daggers at one another in the middle of the party. She does manage to stop a little and dance with Peter, though. I mean, she manages to give a a bit of fun, have a bit of fun on her date. Uh, Occasionally, when she's not like dropping glasses off of, of, of mantle places or telling him to leave and alternatively saying, no, don't go. I mean, Alex Jones looks less guilty than any of these girls at any point in this motion picture. <laughs> They're all looking over their shoulders like they expect to see see her come shambling through the through the doors all like wet and covered with seaweed. <laughs> right. Like we got a creep show situation. They're they're all on pins and needles to see if undead Mrs. Slater shows up. And weirdly enough, the the movie plays like undead Mrs. Slater is killing people. Um, and we are worried about middle- seeing. We are worried about the pool light. If the people oh, yes. jump in They're- the pool, because Pig, right? See Pig and a couple of his friends are getting ready to jump in the pool. <laughs> yes, in their in their tidy whiteies. It's very odd. yeah. Again, a feast for the eyes. If you're looking for man candy, this is not where you're going to find it. Girls' night out has hot guys in it. 
Um, it's rife with hot guys. It's terrible movie, misogynistic trash, but filled with hot guys. House on Sorority Row, ooh, mm, not cast for the ladies. No. And uh, as Stacy mentioned, they all of a sudden become very concerned that if someone turns on the pool light, that they will find a dead body in there, uh, which they, I guess, Sea Pig is unconcerned that he might be swimming in a pool full of corpse juice. But so Stevie heads downstairs to what appears to be the engine room of the Titanic to pull the fuse on the pool lights. Uh, and of course, we see a swinging light bulb, which is never good. Never, never. And that's good. when, no. And that's when Stevie gets stabbed in the face with Mrs. Slater's cane via shadow play. First girl down. And then we cut to the party again, and four out of five doctors has brought up the remaining girls to the front of the stage, so they can be paraded. Like, are they going to be coronated queens of the college? I don't really understand this point but obviously stevie is missing and when someone asks where is stevie uh one of the other sorority girls says she's probably upstairs polishing her tennis shoes oh, <laughs> fucking savage man <laughs> savage and we don't know what that is a euphemism for <laughs> exactly i mean what is that a euphemism for because is it because she's supposedly uptight she doesn't appear that uptight I think it's just something, you know, that typical, you know, they don't actually like each other sort of bitchiness. Mm -hmm. Just denigrating her in the most obtuse fashion possible. During the slow dance, um, Vicky's no good, always wet boyfriend asks, where's my gun? <laughs> good question, idiot. <laughs> you should, if you have a gun, always know where that shit is. Don't ask somebody else. Hey, where's that gun I let you borrow? So it's always a good question. Just kind of, you know, let out in front of a room full of people. Where's my gun? <laughs> hey, remember that gun I gave you? Shh, keep it under. I want to listen to these lyrics from four out of five doctors. <laughs> Meanwhile, lead singer of four out of five doctors. <laughs> With his blonde, super Peter Fran Frampton kind of dyed hair, bleached hair. Yeah, he's like scatting, but on heroin. I don't understand the lyrics of these songs. <laughs> Vicky, um, meanwhile, when they have a, a group meeting of the leftover girls, and obviously Stevie has now gone missing, she has kind of a weird reaction. Like, she doesn't know how guns and bullets work. And I'll be honest with you, I'm with her because I don't know how the guns and bullets in this movie work. She reacts when, when, when Kate's like, you shouldn't have brought a, a, a gun into this prank. You shouldn't have brought a gun at all. She's like, what? It's the weirdest place to put bullets in a gun. Like, how would I ever know? What else is it fucking good for? It's not a paperweight, <laughs> you idiot. But this is all, this is all prelude oh, Vicky. to what is undoubtedly the highlight of this motion picture. And if you haven't watched it and you've been waiting for a reason, I promise you, the reason is exactly 48 minutes into this film when Morgan just pipes up in the middle of the scene and says the following. How do we know she still is still alive? <laughs> very, very Tommy Wiseau-esque delivery I'm not doing there. it justice. <laughs> She's, she, I think she's playing drunk. <laughs> um, I think she might be playing a Martian playing drunk. I'm not, I don't understand. <laughs> I mean, that is a line reading where it sounds like someone is feeding it to her through an earwig and the connection is broken. It is wild <laughs> how the English she puts on that ball. <laughs> I mean, the Harlem Globetrotters do less than she does with that one line. And she's like, hmm, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that line reading pretty much takes the wind out of morgan's i won't even say sales i'm gonna say she has a single sale but we'll get to that because they all split up morgan goes upstairs to look through a closet and sing to herself diane <laughs> meanwhile um goes searching for a corpse in the open space between two cars <laughs> that is so down on her hands and like, knees looking under the cars as if Mrs. Slater is hiding under them. 
as if she's crawled underneath so a VW funny. bus. This corpse is just doing the worm across campus. Like, it, how could it have traveled so far? We may never know. So, as I mentioned, Morgan is upstairs singing to herself, putting clothes away. Whose clothes? We'll never know. But above her, an attic door magically opens as if maybe a rat is pushing the dead body out from it onto the ground. How does the the dead body get up to the attic and then decide to fall out of the attic onto Morgan? Yeah, I don't, yeah, I can't figure out how I got up like, there. Like, I mean, we, I know we just talked about cats, Gina, but do you think those trained uh, cockroaches carried her up to the attic? I mean, sure, you know, I mean, you can train them to dance. <laughs> well, my thought was, of course, Mrs. Slater, that, mm-hmm. that the body is Stevie and Mrs. Slater has wrapped up the body and she's dragged it up to the attic and then released yeah, it because we the don't girls. we don't see the face for at least another half an hour yeah. but when the face is revealed it is mrs slater so um where St- i think stevie is still in in the storage room on the titanic there's no re- reason to move that body they and now the girls have discovered that uh mrs slater is definitely dead and now it's inside the house and they have to do something meanwhile an entire party is going on And no one can hear it. No one. (laughs) If you go into a different room in this house, the band with a fucking keyboard player and full on fucking drums, no one can hear. Yeah, it's like it's like it's like Mrs. Slater thought to soundproof that one room. (laughs) (laughs) It's a tomb. Vicky comes up with a plan. She goes, where will no one look for a dead body? I know the cemetery. No one, I'm sorry, Vicky, that's the only place people look for dead bodies, the cemetery. But okay, fine. Morgan, meanwhile, this has been quite a night. So she goes up to her bedroom where we discover that A, the aforementioned 8 by 10 of her parents hung on the wall. Two, that she has not one but two Garfield posters hung up on the wall, Gina. Okay. Uh, that's yeah i mean she, this is this is up there for one of the better bedrooms we see <laughs> it's really really up there although it, th- there's another bedroom motif we're going to see a little bit later on that that's going to make a, a warm space in your heart and i love how and, morgan is so happy after that body <laughs> has fallen and everything it's like it never happened no and she's putting on I, her little baby doll outfit her little yes. lace shorts and her little lace top, and she's very you know, happy. Just, just the thing you wear when you're sleeping by yourself. <laughs> and there's a dead body and a huge party downstairs. Put on my little... And you've killed somebody yeah. and your friends are missing. It's time for sweepies. I'm so tired. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot out of a person. <laughs> but before she hits the sack, um, Morgan finds a jack in the box. And not the good kind with like whole fried tacos, a haunted kind with a terrible clown inside of it. But before she can really examine it, she gets a whole ass cane through the chest from behind. Is she the one that does the whole crossed eyes thing? I love the crossed eyes thing. <laughs> that just, that just, I, I, again, I also, I don't know where that started as a thing, as a thing in, in, in horror movies either, but the you know, person gets stabbed, they just cross their eyes. Yes. I think I crossed my eyes in front of the 13th part seven. <laughs> <laughs> you, you also, I, not, not to, you know, bag on you. You also had a problem holding your breath. You, you were a very breathing dead oh, body. You could see me point. breathing. Oh. oh, that's the problem with it being on Blu-ray now. Like oh. you can see a lot more than you need to. Oh, well. You, eh, what are you going to do? Like, the everyone's. <laughs> <laughs> can't you can't go back can't for take, it back take now, two baby. now <laughs> it's in the can it's out there um so morgan's on the balcony holding the jack in the box when she gets stabbed right through the window yes and yes her eyes I, and, cross and she and her eyes know. cross like she's in student body but still there's no uh, and, blood anywhere right this is one of the things when katie's searching for morgan there's no blood there's no blood. Like that's uh, this killer may not be great at a lot of things, but I think this killer is great at quick cleanups. Like there's no Morgan blood to be found anywhere uh, when Kate goes up to her bedroom. 
Meanwhile, the rest of the gals are downstairs in a sorority version of Weekend at Bernie's. And they're hand-delivering this corpse to uh, the back door where they're not exactly sure what to do with it or where to go with it to get it to the cemetery when one of them spies the perfect thing. Let's put it in this dumpster. Meanwhile, Kate decides to investigate the aforementioned Annick of Doom, which is complete with a lot of haunted toys and birthday cards filled out for what the audience would believe is a dead child at this point. And uh, they apparently all these girls have been living underneath this living testament to a dead child for four years. And if you want an idea of how crazy this is decorated, every single wall has different insane wallpaper on top of each other. <laughs> there's, there's not a wall that doesn't have a same wallpaper and half the walls have different wallpaper torn up so that you can see what it's covering up. It's just, if you weren't crazy before living in that room, you would definitely become crazy after living in that room. It has a bit of a mime theme. Yeah, like, exactly. mimes happening there. He's a bit of a clown yeah. fan. Let's put that out there. It also has a wonderful stack of letter blocks, both big and small. Um, there's a, a tiny, tiny tricycle that no one should be able to ride. But into this uh, scene, enter Peter. Oh, thank God. We're all saved. Peter's here. And he immediately proclaims, wow, this is a neat room. And th that's when you need to get out. Yeah. When Peter thinks that's a neat room, you're like, there's no other part of Peter that I need to get to know. Wow, cool. <laughs> wow, this, this room comes complete with a dead bird. It's got everything you need. I had a tricycle like this as a kid. <laughs> like, I guess they're projecting that it's quite possible that Peter is secretly Eric. I think they're trying to set him up as a scapegoat here. Does he die later in the movie? I feel like she just kind of hits him and he falls over. And then he gets tranquil. He gets he tranquilized gets by Doctor. Oh, Beck so he's just trying. He just tranquilized then. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> he's unfortunately not killed. Uh, what we all want to have happen, we're denied. Yeah, he's, he's completely ineffectual. I don't know why he's in the movie. What is Peter? Uh, well, oh yeah, I do. Yeah, for the end. he's a red herring. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, and you think maybe he'll come to save the day, and then he gets tranquilized, and you're like, yeah, he's about as good as I thought he would be. Good for nothing. Min meanwhile, we learn that Liz has been gifted a wonderfully early 80s boogie van that, Gina, we've seen some great boogie vans on this show. But have we ever seen a boogie van that has its own phone? Um, did, What's his face from prom night? He didn't have a phone in his? I know he had like the secret joint stash, but... He has a secret joint stash, and I know he had a CB radio, but I don't think it's a full-ass phone. Yeah, uh, oh, does that, does that mean this one wins then? Uh, it, it might. It, it's, it's, very, it's very high up there. I mean, there's a lot of accoutrement. Plus, the radio, we learn, is tuned to the Blues Brothers backing band station. Well, I mean, that, then clearly that's the winner. And it's, 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 it's housed in, I guess, a barn of doom, like... This is the most dilapidated college property I've ever seen in my life. Like everywhere on campus is shoddy. There's just grass growing out of the concrete. If a good breeze happened, I think half of the campus would fold over on top of itself. What was the, what uh, was the, Patrick, what was the movie we watched a while back that also took place on a college campus? And then you realize that like, they just like, you know, somebody died and they just buried their body on the campus. <laughs> that's killer, killer party. party that's right yeah they just like they just like dug up the lawn and then just stuck somebody in the backyard of the college campus yeah. yeah just and not someone who owned the house just a kid who went to that frat they're like he died here we should probably bury him in the backyard <laughs> <laughs> that is not how you dispose of a body unless it's like that unless it takes place in New Jersey and that frat now becomes tax exempt, which is something we learned from uh, Mr. Donnie Trump this week. <laughs> There's a horror movie for you. I mean. <laughs> Very much is. <laughs> so 
Diane is spooked by everything in this van. Then she's spooked by everything outside the van. She gets back inside the van and is stabbed through the hand by the cane. And then we, I have to assume through the face because we don't actually see it. The movie doesn't have the budget for multiple faces to get stabbed. So, Gina, I'm going to call this one a get bunked because it happens through a sunroof. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely count that. Um, we haven't had a nice get bunked in a little while, so I was very happy about that. Um, meanwhile, let's get back to corpse in a dumpster. You know, the perfect crime. That is, until you walk that dumpster straight into a cop car. Just like gradually just coasts into it. <laughs> and what is the cop may- doing? Is he just sitting watching the girls push it into the car? Uh, he's having a love affair with a sandwich? I don't really know. Like, I, he's just so into his coffee, he doesn't see that coming. How you can sneak up on a cop pushing a whole ass dumpster? I don't know. But then again, fucking cops, what are they good for? <laughs> he doesn't even see that Jeannie just takes off. Um, and then Liz and Vicky are just left there to take the fall. But luckily for them, the cop gets called to another scene and he's like, well, you know, this collision, it happens every other day. You're off the hook. Push that corpse filled dumpster somewhere else. You girls should take the trash out on a different day. One forty five in the morning. One I mean, I mean, is that so? Day. Is that so weird? I, I, I take trash out at one forty five in the morning. Right. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't take it I don't out think at you, 10, But 13. Gina, do you push a dumpster down the not, lane? Not an entire dumpster, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, not every week, but on special weeks. Only you on get Tuesdays. The <laughs> <laughs> right. Only when you got a dump uh, only when you got a corpse to transport, that's when you get the dumpster. So Jeannie takes off back towards the house, and of course she's immediately attacked outside. And then <laughs> She somehow fends off the killer, can't see who it is, gets into the kitchen where it's revealed that the sorority has the largest fucking stack of of shitty beer I've ever seen in my life. (laughs) It's a mountain of terrible beer that you would never want to drink. I mean, that's just college. I think I missed the beer because I was like, why didn't she lock the door? (laughs) Yeah, we leave that for Dr. Beck. He's the only one who understands how doors work. Everyone else has Crystal Lake disease where they forget a very simple thing. So uh, Kate finds Jeannie and she's like, tell me what happened. She's like, I don't know, your name, a cane, raising cane. Is it time for chicken strips? I don't fucking know. Anyways, Kate's like, you stay here. And Jeannie's like, got it. Going to run upstairs. And so Jeannie runs upstairs into the bathroom, which she cannot get out. She locked herself inside of a stall. And then the killer decides to turn on every faucet and every shower because he likes it wet and steamy, I guess. It's a spooky, we don't know. It's a spooky effect. Yes. Uh, and so Jeannie, it turns out, takes a king to the side of the throat and then later is decapitated when we don't see it. Oh, I mean, we see her head later. Right. That's, that head, that, um, I, I think that's just the girl like sticking her head out of a toilet. Cause it looks, it looks a lot better oh, yeah. than the, uh, than, than the, the, the head in the forest. I With agree. the melted candle yes. head. Oh, 100%. It's her head in a toilet <laughs> and it works great. <laughs> No I just notes. want to hear how how this was you know pitched to her that she's gonna do. This. <laughs> You're gonna get down on the floor on your hands and knees. <laughs> We're gonna build a, a toilet around, around you. your head. A, a yeah. what? <laughs> <laughs> then we're gonna spill some Kool Aid around you, and you're just gonna stare at the camera. Okay, okay, sure. Why not? Decapitated head, no blood on the floor. The killer <laughs> yeah. is a janitor. <laughs> no, but there, and we see blood on the wall, but yes. apparently he cleans that up. Like he's really good. He's just good at his job. Meanwhile, Kate has now entered stage three of Banana Town. She tries to call the cops, but then she can't. Then she dials it again. The cops answer, but she won't talk to them. Enter Peter, because who wouldn't want to talk to Peter? Kate, it turns out. Peter then pulls out a pitch perfect, have you considered my penis move? 
just if someone is obviously distressed, it's probably not an entree to you getting busy that night. Can't read like, the room. Peter can't read the room. N- no, no. Uh, but Peter's like, mm, uh, I know you're anxious about something, but uh, have you <laughs> considered my penis? And Kate's like, no. I have not. <laughs> <laughs> I have not, nor will I. Peter, take a fucking hint. Cut to Vicky and Liz. Back at the boogie van, they found an open grave and have decided to dig underneath where that corpse will eventually be and put uh, Mrs. Slater's body underneath that. Again, perfect crime. Like, I got to give it up to Vicky. She's thinking on her She's feet. obviously done this before. <laughs> she has to have, right? This can't be her first dead corpse getting rid of Rodeo. I'm telling you, Vicky is the psychopath of yes. the movie. Yeah. Uh, if if that was the x-ray of her brain, it turned out that Dr. Beck was looking at, I would believe it. Um, we, we learn at a certain point when Dr. Kate then finds the necklace that is, if you see a, if you, the crazy person wearing this necklace is lost, call this doctor. So she dials up Dr. Beck and it says it's Catherine Ra- uh, Rose. And immediately I was like, is she related to the Shits Creek roses? <laughs> Distant cousin. David, we have to get rid of this corpse. <laughs> so Kate calls Dr. Beck and he goes, stay exactly where you are. Don't move. Stay as close as you can and vulnerable to a murderer as you possibly can. And I'll be right over. Oh, I, I missed something. When, when Liz and Vicky pull up to the cemetery, we hear Liz say out loud, I don't see any open graves oh, at yeah. the cemetery. <laughs> then they're like, oh, there's one. Oh, thank goodness. We're saved. There's an open grave. It's like, it's like a, you know, you know, luckily for them, a, uh, a grave digger just like, map lunchtime, just walked away without finishing the grave. At night. Right. At night, just left a hole wide open in the ground. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, uh, they, they finished digging. Uh, Vicky sends Liz back to the boogie van to go back it up so they can just shove mrs slater's body into it when liz gets back to the boogie van she's immediately attacked by the killer with the cane and her throat is slashed um i'm I'm sorry liz you got a great van vicky's like where is liz she wanders back to the boogie van and is immediately attacked herself she's clubbed with the cane several times and finally stabbed through the eye uh poor went out for vicky everyone yeah (laughs) <laughs> um and meanwhile dr beck has arrived at sorority row uh, and kate takes him up to the attic of doom where there appears to be a small model of 1426 elm street <laughs> in the background <laughs> it's a very weird piece of accoutrement and this is when dr beck starts doling out some information because kate's like I don't know. It seems like someone lived here and there's birthday cards and there's toys and Mrs. Slater didn't tell us anything about this. And Dr. Beck's like the flop sweat starts to pour. And he's like, uh, okay. So like 20 years ago, I performed an illegal medical experiment on Mrs. Slater and now it's really backfiring. So please don't call the cops. And, and now it's alive. He's ta- <laughs> but he's talking to the right girl because Kate is criminally unable to call the cops in this situation yeah no it's like she forgot how to dial a phone so you know he's like there's something you're not telling me there's something you're not telling me and she's like oh yeah my friends and i kind of mistakenly killed mrs slater and they're gonna bury her at the cemetery and he's like get in the car we're going on a road trip and this is kind of sends Kate into stage four banana town. This is Academy Award winning stuff from this point on. She is, she is chosen to freak the fuck out. And I like it. They mm-hmm. get to the cemetery and they discover that both Vicky and Liz are dead. But so is Mrs. Slater. So someone else is killing people and it's not Mrs. Slater. Holy shit. So what do they do? You drive to the cops. No, no, that's wrong. You drive to the military. No, no. You drive to any fucking authority. Not at all. 
Let's head back to the house on Sorority Row. And meanwhile, when they pull up to the driveway, Dr. Beck drugs Kate just full up shoots her full of horse, I guess. I don't know what she gets, but I'd like it's a mild tranquilizer, which causes her to hallucinate. (laughs) She fucking (laughs) she has a breakdown. He makes her bait. She needs her as bait. He plops her down in a lazy boy and she begins to hallucinate all of her friends and Mrs. Slater in what I can only describe as uh, an early Devo music video. (laughs) And there's a young couple dancing. Was that Mrs. Slater when she was young? I don't know. There's a young couple dancing and then her friends are all saying, come be with us. Come be with us. What is with the dancing couple? What does any of it mean? Who Why is, is the, the dancing ki- couple? It's a it's a mystery, Stacy. I don't understand it. But this is one of the things I love about particularly slasher movies of this little era, right in the early eighties. It's like they can be standard as they come, and you know your mileage may vary in terms of whether or not you love uh, this particular film or not. But when it hits the third act. And Kate starts to hallucinate and have a fucking drug freak out in the middle of this third act. It's like, yeah, baby, you're going for it. This this movie is swinging. And I love it from this moment on. When I saw this happen, when I first watched it, I'm like, oh, this is on the list. We're talking about this movie. (laughs) And from that moment on, Kate seems highly suggestible. When she tries to get up, Dr. Beck's like, no, I think you need to sit down. She's like, Yes, okay. need to sit down, me. It turns out that Mrs. Slater did give birth to her child named Eric. He's alive. He's abominable. And, and he's crazy yeah. pants. <laughs> and then Dr. Beck goes, just like I told her he would be. <laughs> <laughs> is, that, is that fucking hospital policy? So, so, so right, she, right when the baby came, right when he pulled the baby out of the womb, he was like, well, it's going to be crazy. This, this baby's <laughs> destined to kill people with a sharpened cane. This baby is a Tasmanian devil and you just don't know it yet. I, I, I don't, I told you, you would give birth to a crazy baby, but you wouldn't listen. And okay, I guess, but somehow Mrs. Slater is allowed to check out her terminally crazy child for summer vacation at the old house and keep him in the attic. And then when September rolls around, she's like, all right, back to the mental hospital with you. <laughs> and he just leaves? I, I thought that she had had him up there the whole, hidden in there the whole time. No. no. He stays in an institution, right? And then he gets to come for the summer. Right? He, it, this is his summer camp. I was going to say, it's like- His it's, summer it, camp is to be locked in the like attic. It's like reverse summer camp. Yes, exactly. But she's his he gets, mommy, he, right? So he saw them murder her to the attic right. window through the attic window and then he systematically started killing sorority sisters while being hidden in the walls a la black christmas it's it's a wild mash up so here we have kate drugged out of her mind dr beck not a great doctor so who will save the day gina Peter. 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 He's immediately tranquilized and hits the we, deck. Great we don't job. Hear, no we don't hear from him again. He may be dead. We don't know. We don't even see him. It's fantastic. We never see him again. He just stays on the floor. For the I, we, we leave him as we, he, he leaves the film as he is introduced into the film practically unconscious. Yes. So while his, Dr. Beck kneels next to him and for reasons I can't quite understand just starts fiddling with his trank gun and kate goes into stealth mode and manages to outrun this undrugged middle-aged man throughout this entire house upstairs we get that full-on jaws on the beach push pull uh in the hallway i'm like i'm here for it this movie's trying all of a sudden um meanwhile dr beck's like kate you got to listen to me. The only way to get Eric is to trap him. Is it? Is it the only way to get <laughs> Eric? There's no other way to deal with this guy. couldn't call the police? No. It's like, we, you see, we had to, no. the only way I, you can catch him is to chase after him with a comically large net. Right, exactly. They've got to Scooby-Doo this shit. Like, I've got a net. And if if you are, are Shaggy and Scoob and you lure him into it, 
like it'll all work out. Then we'll pull off his mask. It was Mr. Henderson all along. And, you know, suddenly somehow Dr. Beck will keep his doctor's license. But Kate has run up to Vicky's room. Why? Vicky still has the gun. This is where we discover that Vicky's room, quite like Nancy's house in A Nightmare on Elm Street, is filled with other people's headshot photos taped to the wall. (laughs) It's very disturbing. I just, I don't know how this became a thing, but it is very much a thing we found in these, in these motion pictures that they believe that regular people decorate their bedrooms with the headshots (laughs) of other actors. Like it's a like it's an agent's office or 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 they're at Sardi's or something. It's just a very odd move, decoration wise. Yeah, it's just I, like I it's, think the props department probably didn't have enough funding. So yeah, I was gonna say, I was gonna say office. Yeah, we can't have blank walls. Just throw something up there. Either, either this or you know, so, <laughs> it's either this is a triple A roadmaps. <laughs> Yeah, not every room can be decorated with Garfield posters <laughs> and, and the eight by ten of your parents who watch you <laughs> fuck. Um, so uh, Kate is hiding by the door. <laughs> well, we see somebody, an unnamed person's headshot behind her. Meanwhile, Doctor Beck's like, "Come on, be my Shaggy and Scoob," and Eric just completely waylays him, takes a shot to the torso, another shot, a shot with the cane to the throat. And then Dr. Beck grabs his temples like he's having an Excedrin headache and falls off the second story banister onto the ground. Kate, this wakes Kate up. I don't know how she hears it because normally in this movie, if something happens in a different room, you can't hear shit. But somehow in her drug state, she's she's reached a daredevil-like perception level of, of Banana Town. And so she walks back out to the hallway, now armed, and sees that Eric is dressed in that uh, jester outfit, but he has the the mask off, and you get a quick view of his. Gina, does he? Does Eric have a clay face? He does kind of look a little bit like like he, like someone stuck some sculpey on. <laughs> like he looks like he has silly putty where his face should be, and his eyes are hidden underneath the silly putty. Which is odd because when he's got the clown mask on later, it just looks like a mask over a regular normal face. Right. So I like what was it is did they just give up on it or they're like, this isn't good. We need to put a mask on him. It's like we cannot do a close up of this makeup. Right. <laughs> like <laughs> all of a sudden it's Tootsie and they're like, I want to make her look a little bit better. Can you pull back? And the cameraman's like, how about Cleveland? <laughs> So Kate now seeing that Eric is uh, unleashed and that that Dr. Beck has failed to net him uh, Scooby-Doo style decides to uh, she pulls Jeannie's gambit and runs to the toilet. She finds Jeannie's head in that toilet, which is a typical, you know, uh, Greek party aftermath. And then she runs out of the back door of the bathroom have you been to a bathroom that has a back door? <laughs> no, not you mention it. That leads to a balcony. Le- a back door to a balcony, and then she can't remember how to leave. No, the house. she falls in front of the yeah. the the great the the railing of the balcony as if she's in jail. <laughs> she's like, I can't get out of here. There's just no way out. But then she spies a ladder up to the attic of doom, and she's like, Oh. That's worse. So she climbs straight up into the attic of doom. But don't worry, everyone. Kate's got a plan. She's going to set a trap with that jack in the box. That'll lure Eric. And then Eric is, he'll be, he'll be uh, hypnotized by that jack in the box. And he'll be in perfect for a headshot. Meanwhile, she is going full on banana town level 20,000. Like she is experiencing hallucinations of people in the pool. Uh, she is not, she's transported to a different realm. Uh, she's just gone to Oz and back. And before you know it, it turns out that Eric has teleported inside the attic of doom. He's put on the, 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 the mask 
of that uh, uh, <laughs> the the Joke- clown the clown jokester. The client, yeah, the whatever the hell that's called. And then he just kind of like slowly winds up. <laughs> he practically points to the right field like he's Babe Ruth and then swings as slowly as possible towards her, which she ducks a completely drugged woman out of the way. She responds to this by firing at Eric four times and hits nothing. Again, are there any real bullets in this gun at any point? I I don't know. It's very they, it's sounded, very they sounded like blanks. Right. So I'm so, so I'm thinking it's a gun that has a magazine that holds bullets but can also <laughs> shoot blanks. Hold blanks. Maybe they're interspersed yeah. for fun and profit. Who who can say? So she fires four times at Eric hits nothing. And then Eric is distracted by a toy on the ground. Kate reaches for a different toy, a baby doll. Why? I don't know. Turns out it's the best move she could ever have made. (laughs) Because guess what's underneath that baby doll head? A knife. You know, like baby dolls have. A head knife. An underhead knife. I had no idea growing up with baby dolls that if you took their heads off, there was a knife. There's killing instruments yeah. under every baby doll head. We, you, you just, no one ever takes the doll's head off to find them. But Kate knows the secret. So she yanks off that doll's head and stabs Eric several times until he falls down the attic stairs to his doom. And she's saved because Eric sure looks dead until his eyes open and credits. Eric too. <laughs> Peter, wake up, Peter. And the whole time I'm thinking, did anybody pay the band? <laughs> no. Uh, they're waiting, they're, I hope they got paid. They're, they're waiting Are they still the, there? Is the, the they're, waiting for that, they're waiting for that tip. They're just gathering up. They're gathering up all the extra booze and protests. I imagine that they're still playing. And we just don't know it because we can't hear. Right. Well, who do you think those hallucinations were dancing yeah. to? Probably four out of five da- uh, doctors, uh, a band that I don't think existed before, during or after this motion picture. Oh, boy. What a motion picture. Did we miss anything that anyone wants to talk about on, hor- on house on horse on sorority row? Horse on horse on haunted hill. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I, I thought this was a fun little movie, honestly. I love it. I love this film. I I love it. It's dumb. It's perfectly dumb. It's innocently trying to do cool stuff. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But it's a trier. It's one of those things where there are certain movies with charm and certain movies without it. And in my opinion, this movie has charm. Stacey, what did you think? I think it delivers on the promise, as we say in in the writing business, it delivers Mm -hmm. on the promise of the premise, right? So it's like, mm-hmm. I'm looking at the description here, after a seemingly innocent prank goes horribly wrong. That is not an innocent prank. I love prank, it, right? Yes. A, a group of sorority <laughs> sisters are stalked and murdered one by one while throwing a party. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what happens. Yeah. It's yeah. not an innocent it, it prank. And, and I think that, you know, it's debatable to me whether or not Eric or Vicky are actually the bigger psychopath. I mean, you know, Eric has, at least has the motivation. They killed his <laughs> mother. But Vicky, Vicky like, what's her deal? Like, wrong. they murdered my waterbed? <laughs> That's right. She was perfectly sane up until the point her her waterbed was right. Killed. And suddenly she's pushing a body in a dumpster. I thought it was a. Fu- I thought it was a fun movie. <laughs> uh, I love this motion picture, and I think people should check it out. It is available for everyone to watch on things like Tubi and Freevee, or if you have Shutter, you can watch it. Uh, without commercial interruption i have a fantastic blu-ray of it um i i can't remember who released i think it's severin films that released the version of uh house that i have but uh, either way it's a good film to watch you should watch it but before we wrap things up of course we have to do uh, something here. We do it every time that there's multiple deaths it's when we choose your own death venture that is where we decide of the Benny deaths uh, in this motion picture. If you were to choose one of those ways to die, uh, which one of them would you choose and why? Up for bid for everyone. We have shot by gun or heart attack, uh, cane to the throat, cane to the face, 
came through the chest from the back, stabbed inside of a bird cage. You get bunked through the sunroof, came to the side of the throat and later decapitated, throat slashed, clubbed with cane and stabbed through eye, came to the ribs, throat and fall from the second story balcony. Or you can be stabbed with a baby doll knife. And Stacy, as our guest, I choose you to go first. I got to go with uh, stabbed in the neck and then decapitated later. Sure. <laughs> it's quick. You die in a bathroom that's very steamy. I mean, if you like humid weather, you're going to be in a happy place. And I'm place still wearing my go. makeup. Sure. <laughs> it's I look a, great. It's a, my your hair looks mascara great. is running a little bit because you were pushed was, into a pool for, full of corpse yeah. juice. But, you know, other than that, you're yeah, doing great. I like the big toilet head reveal. I want to go with that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a great reveal. Uh, Gina, what's that? You? Oh. Um, I think that I'm going to go with stab with a baby knife because I just think it'd be funny to be found dead in a clown suit. (laughs) 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 Now, are you going to go with clay face or without clay face for your, well, I mean, I'm going to have the clown mask on. So, so you won't be able to see either way. Okay. That's that's very true. And no one's going to be able to take it off because it'll stick to the clay. Exactly. Um, yeah, there's a lot going on here. I think I'm going to go with maybe shot by a gun or heart attack because I think that's probably how I will go. <laughs> Either shot by a gun or a heart attack. One of the so ways some, I think that's so my real So somebody is going to, to play a harmless prank on you that involves pointing, <laughs> and, point, pointing a loaded gun and threatening you? Listen, yeah. okay. I, 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 yeah, I, I mean, I've seen how my son operates and I figure innocent prank is how I'm going All to All right, go. just don't lose your medical alert tag. That's right. That's the worst thing that could possibly happen. Uh, I don't think I have a doctor as attentive as Dr. Beck. Uh, uh, that's the kind of thing only, you know, sorority house uh, rental money can buy. That might be buy, a good thing. <laughs> that's true. Um, of course, Josh Hollis does all of our artwork and uh, Revenge Body does all of our songs. Uh, if you want to hear uh, our theme or any of the remixes, go to me- uh, Revenge Body Memphis at bandcamp.com and check it out for yourself and hand him some ducats. Uh, Stacy, you have a brand new book out. Why don't you tell our audience all about it and where they can find I it? I do. I'll tell you real quick about it. Thank you. Um, it's called All the Girls in Town. You can find it wherever you buy books. If they don't have it there, they can order it for you. And uh, it's, you know, tonight's theme, I think the House of Sorority Row is about revenge, right? Eric's doing revenge. So this book is about revenge. Uh, Mm -hmm. Here's the um, pitch. Uh, Three smart, sexy, slightly messed up women join forces to wreak vengeance on the rock star who destroyed their lives. Oh, I love it. Fantastic. And I'm assuming that this is available anywhere you can find books. Yes, anywhere you can find books. All right, do it today, people. Uh, Gina, where can people find you on these here internets? I write about television and movies at theschool.net. Some of my recent reviews have included They Slash Them and um, Netflix's Day Shift, uh, neither of which are as entertaining as this movie was. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And uh, you can find me on Twitter under Gina Does Things. Do it today. People checking out. You can always find us on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. Uh, our Patreon is a great place to help the, the podcast, uh, you know, stay alive and free for everyone to use. We're, we're watching Halloween films and talking over them and, and commentaries and covering cool movies like Barb and Star. Go to Vista Del Mar, which is a fantastic comedy everyone should watch and then listen to our episode about. And of course, please rate and review us on iTunes or wherever you get podcasts. Uh, I know every podcast asks you to rate and review them, but it really is the way we get seen and heard by more people. So we ask you from the bottom of our hearts, please do us a solid. Don't innocently prank us and don't rate and review us. Come on, do it for us. Stab us with a cane, with love. Uh, That just about does it, but don't worry, folks. The body count will continue for myself, for Stacy, and for Gina. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.